Okay, this, uh, this, this could be quite interesting, this next topic. I, I know one of these guys pretty well, and the other one I've only just met today, but uh, they're going to talk on precision commodity application trial for commercial return. Now, Brad and Kate Jones farm at Tamman with a 100% cropping operation. Uh, now, he does say here the farm was originally Kate's, but he's, uh, or his par her parents, but uh, he's transformed that into a, a quite a very a productive farm since he's taken it over. So, Brad's parents were cotton farmers in the Darling Downs in Queensland, and, and Brad still is an ag pilot with a business in Queensland, uh, uh, in Queensland before selling it to concentrate on farming in WA. Kate was an ABC Journal and presented country area in WA, South Australia, and Victoria, and you may remember her on the radio, some of you. Uh, Brad and Andrew went to school together and share a drive towards making ag more efficient and profitable with the use of technology. And uh, I might just add here that Brad and Kate rewarded the 2016 Coles Australian Grain Farmers of the Year in February. So congratulations to them for that. So it's all yours, Brad. Uh, thank you, Want, for, for giving us the opportunity to come and talk about our journey uh, over the last couple of years, it's been quite an interesting one. Um, a little bit similar to putting a blindfold on and walking around in the dark with the amount of things that we've bumped into and the mistakes that we've made. Anyway, this first slide um, is basically, a, a, I'll, I'll wind it back a little bit. So I'll be talking about my motivation in, in going down this road and how uh, I engaged Andrew to take it from there. And he'll talk about some of the issues that he's... Uh, he's faced and, and uh, together we're still stumbling along. So my first slide basically gives a, a timeline of 100 years of ag development. Um, the mechanisation revolution is when we basically got tractors and that started to grow when uh, we had auto steer, we had um, uh, cabs on tractors. That was one of the biggest revolutions there was. Then we come into the biotech revolution where we start to look at uh, genetic improvements, we start to look at uh, hybrids. Um, when I grew up on the family farm in Queensland, like we were cotton farmers, and we, uh, if we achieved a really good outcome for a, for a yield, it was five to six bales to the hectare. Today, using those, that same biotechnology and mechanisation, it's 10 to 12 bales to the hectare. So our next big kick is going to be the ag tech revolution. So we've got to start looking at our farm. We'll stop looking at our farm on a 2D per metre squared basis. And we've got to start managing our farm cubic metres. We've got to start looking at it at 3D. We've got to start looking at the spatial subterranean maps that can address all of our risk and, and look at our soil constraints. And then we can overlay our spatial terrestrial maps NDVI images, sensors, and that's where we can really start to capture opportunities in the future. When we start that rise there, that's when, if you, if you want to look at it in a way, uh, we, we have to start managing margin because the money has to come before the tonnes, not the other way around. I'll let you think about that for a bit. So. Looking, uh, when, when I first started looking at the, what the Canadians have been doing, back in 2010, they were looking at uniform seed placement. And the biggest kicker, as you can see up there, is actually coming, the most yield is gained from the low density populations. They have a very different environment to us, like most of their seeding happens with moisture after snow melt, where we have a very volatile beginning to the season more often than not. So if, they, if they're getting like up to 32% yield increase from what they're doing there, our opportunity should be at least that same, if not greater. So when I first spoke to Andrew and, uh, and Danny from um, Ag IT about bringing in the technology, we, we had to have Greenfield build. There was nothing on the rack that we could, we could take down and, and build. So we were, it was a Greenfield build. So, but our, Objectives had to be very, very clear. We wanted the hybrid technology. Hybrid technology is part of that biotech revolution. It's going to happen more and more so in the future. So we wanted it for its agronomic benefits. We wanted to be able to use it for its technology, whether it be Roundup Ready or a clear field system, and we wanted it for its hybrid. 
We wanted to change our spatial management to go from a 2D to a 3D. We'd already started that back in 2008 when we started variable rate. But we, want, we, we wanted to keep progressing that further on. And we wanted to capture quality data, because it's not about big data, it's about quality data. And you want to be able to use that data for the best outcomes possible. We've been focused on canola when we first built this. And we did in the first year uh, use some across some wheat and some field peas, but we've been focused mainly on canola because that's the highest risk crop that we've got and the potential of the highest return. Um, Andrew will talk about some of the research that he's been doing about targeting nutrition and, and aiming it basically with the seed so we can further optimise all of our, all of our inputs for, um, for future. Right, I'll pass it over to Andrew and he can talk about some of the issues that we've, uh, and some of the fun that we've had along the way. Thanks, Brad. Uh, this will just run through this slide, uh, the uh, video as we go through for start. One of the uh, big things that just flashed up there briefly was understanding Western Australian soils and understanding the uh, the type of adaptions that we need to uh, look at that we haven't been looking at in, in the east coast, and that's all around the technology that allows us to engage the ground in the first place. Because as we know, Western Australia is much different to the soil types we're dealing with in the east. Then we went through the process of uh, initially looking this as, as a linkage machine. Um, so again. Brad and I having background on this side, uh, then uh, linkage around precision ag and control traffic systems has become a big part of our life. So we looked at that in the first place. Then we looked at the weight of the equipment and where it was going to fit. And, uh, and obviously linkage was going to be something that was going to put enormous stress in the equipment and therefore uh, looking at um, you know, bringing that back to a, a, a trailed machine. We then looked at all the other adaptable technology that we need to bring into play. And so therefore, as you see there at the moment, having that in one pass, that's dropping fertiliser in a liquid form about 75 mils in, uh, to 100 mils in the profile. And at that point in time, it was around 10 to 15 millimetres is where we were placing the seed at about 15 to 16 centimetres apart on a 12 inch or 30 centimetre row spacing was our target when we put that, um, put that. That was the first day that we put the machine in the, in the field. Uh, and uh, then we added on uh, a lot of other, um, at, at the uh, fertiliser in the liquid form and other technology as we progressed to be able to start to monitor. Now when we went to uh, looking at seed placement and I ideally getting the placement you're seeing up there now, that's not always been the case. We've had a, a number of challenges along the way to be able to get that accurate seed placement. And when I say that, things that you'd never dreamt of, static electricity, um, you know, and the impact on that on a plastic plate with uh, small seed and so on. So therefore, this year we looked at separating that. So you can see that the, the tine on the far right is working much more aggressively than the one second in, but we've separated that. So one of the things that we had to go down the path was separating the fertiliser placement and also then from the, from the seed placement so that when we get into rocks and varying soil types and, and configurations that we didn't get the breakout that was going to impact our, our, the, the two elements or the two commodities we're trying to precision place. And as Brad said, that 3D position and understanding exactly how we manage not only the surface but the surface relevant to what's below the surface and how we can best manage water use efficiency, nutrition and other elements. So, so with that we've had... Um, our key goal has been around not only looking at canola because of the move towards hybridisation and again coming from the east, it's about understanding from where my background is as a farmer, I also had an agronomic as an agronomic business for 25 years, grain marketing, so it was about packaging all of the experience we've had together to look at the return on investment and understand not just canola as seed has become more expensive but also to understand similarly to what we've done in the east understand that spatial management, how low can we go with high cost products, commodities in general, not just seed, and how we can manage that spatially on the surface and into the profile. So one of the things I'd also like to acknowledge here is that uh, our coming into Western Australia and being involved in not only interacting with um, farmers like Brad that are, that are really looking to what's the next silver bullet for ag, uh, we've been through the genetic phase, we're looking at how, impact, how much impact we'll receive from mechanisation and then uh, understanding that last year, towards the end of last year, uh, we won the COGO Award through Giwa and um, the Piper, Piper Award. So with the ag innovation around that, so we really appreciate the support and recognition that's there, particularly coming from a background that's not from Western Australia. So one of the things I want to look at and why we're pursuing this, this path of singulation and, and management of each individual seed. You can see there, that's corn plants. That's a, a machine that we put into central Queensland this year, singulating corn and spatial management. 
And as it says there, the coefficient variation formulas that we've had now available for nearly 20 years to be able to calculate the variability and the, and the, and the economic loss based on the um, inability to space plants evenly within the row. So therefore we've pursued, we've got that formula for that for nearly 20 years. We've only in the last three to five years developed it for sorghum. We've got some close formulas for uh, cotton, but realistically we've had minimal consideration for other crops and that's where we've really wanted to be able to achieve that. So as I said before, it hasn't been an easy, easy path um, because there's things that we never imagined being possible uh, and they haven't experienced even in the US when they've developed a lot of this seed singulation technology. And the one machine that, that Brad has at the moment, the seed singulator or the seed metering unit, is from pre precision planting. And some of you may have seen on Twitter and, and on other media sources over the last couple of weeks that Agco bought precision planting from Monsanto. So they now have that technology, but I think that it'll still be available for retrofitting, which is where it's been based. So the static electricity came from these plates. So the plate on the, uh, on the left is the canola plate that we've been using. It's an 80 cell plate. Um, it's typically spinning it around about the, uh, the 7 to 20 RPM. Now, to try and get our seed populations relevant to that RPM is critical, but the faster it spins, the more static electricity we generate, the bigger the problem with the seed, to a point where when we bench tested some of these things after we found the, uh, the effect of static, we could turn the vacuum off and seed will still turn and just pick up on the plate. Sometimes they release, sometimes they don't. So grounding that is something we've really had to work on. And the other plate up there, released when we were in the US two or three weeks ago, and that's the new wheat seed plate. That one was taken to photo when I was over in the US in, in March. Uh, since then they've released and developed the wheat plate, and it's now been tested in Victoria with another farmer that we've been um, working closely with on seed singulation. So that pretty much creates the whole suite of, uh, of, of plates that we need to be able to cover all crops. So on that basis, then designing and the equipment for that spatial management, that's uh, in a picture form what we we're looking at this year, having that separate time. There's also, that's the basic time, we've actually looked at a lot of other add-ons. So that front shank is also adaptable to consider discs and other configurations. So we're effectively building a chassis that we can add on and move around the tooling to suit the environment. Because talking to a lot of farmers right across Australia, Soils ain't soils, so the fact is that we need to be able to understand how we engage the ground in different environments to be able to deliver the commodity most effectively. So therefore, these are some of the ones that we've been developing in the east. Um, we've gone from the box that you saw, a 1.6 bushel box that was on the original units that we've been developing, and as time's gone on across the world, we're starting to see uh, small seeding units. So we're getting towards the um, what they now call uh, these uh, singulators through uh, the small seed boxes or, or um, centralised commodity systems. So they get delivered or the seed be becomes delivered, deliverable to those units on the fly through a cent central box that has a uh, venturi type system to deliver them to continuously self-fill. So we've looked at there and as you can see on there we've got the uh, adaptable shank so we'll be able to uh, um, bring those shanks in, take them out, put double discs in. Uh, again, depending on the soil type and what's, in, what's required to engage the soil on the day or in, or in a particular environment is what we've tried to achieve to have the adaptability. As I said, those uh, mini seed hoppers, they get fed centrally from the, uh, a CCS system. This is the John Deere type that we first started looking at. Um, but I'd also acknowledge the farmer in, uh, in Victoria, Steve Lanyon, has also done a lot of work, um, like Brad has, to look at what works in his environment. Um, his soil type in particular works with a double disc. Um, he doesn't have to look at the incorporation of uh, herbicides and, and uh, placement of fertiliser at depth and so on. A lot of his program is um, pre-applied fertiliser. So therefore his business spot on ag, he's also developed uh, now a central seed commodity system because one of the issues we've had is working from canola right through to corn, soybean, lupins and whatever else, that diverse range of seed and those these central units, um, basically as they place in, the seed falls down onto in the centre of those, it also then picks up through the venturi and blows out to the unit. As you'd imagine, the movement of seed through uh, the different seed sizes and types um, vary dramatically. Um, through that spatial management, we really need to understand the technology, and this has been a big learning curve for us as far as spatial management is one thing, all the technology in the world, but unless we get the people to understand, and that's why we've teamed up with um, Danny Weir and the guys at uh, Ag IT, is we need to be able to make sure 
that we understand how to work with a Trimble system, a John Deere, an Ag Leader, no matter what you're using, we need to be able to get this communication through, utilise the data, so we're now working from end to end on data solutions as well. So understanding the agronomic data, the land data, farm management, machinery, weather, um, and really understand the technology uh, to select the, for your, the best utilisation of that data on your farming system. The other thing that we've really started to learn is that the monitoring systems we have now with seed technology, th this, these machines have um, the ability to count 135 seeds per second per row. So if you take a 1.2 million seeds per hectare of wheat planted at uh, 8 to 10 kilometres an hour, you're looking at around about 85 to 100 uh, seeds per second. So we've got now the ability to count every seed at 99% accuracy, 93% accuracy on canola. So with that, we can now, that blue line there is, uh, is a row that was purposely put to s select doubles. So you can pick up, the, the yellow is a misplaced seed, the green is perfectly placed seed, and the blue is where you're picking up a double. So we can now understand and sit in the cabin, or even remotely, from a desktop computer or an iPad, and understand exactly uh, where the field is, and to a point where the field view system that Brad uses I could be sitting in Toowoomba and if row seven started playing up, it'll send me a text to say, get that uh, operator to pull up because there's a problem with row six, it's dropped back to 70% of its population. So using that technology then to understand efficiencies and adaptability, uh, we look into variable rate technology and then having the ability to be able to look at things like um, varying soil depths, varying soil depth, whether that's subsoil constraints or just purely soil, soil depth to rock then looking at how you can use that, like Brad said, in a 3D image, understanding the technology and how we can best manage water use efficiency, nutrition uptake, and spatially manage that, and now we can get that down right to the row. That also leads me then into where the rest of the world is going, and we've brought this technology now into Australia where we're building and uh, bringing in research equipment because one of the big issues I see in Australian ag is that farmers like Brad that really want to be innovative to look at where the next uh, economic return or gain is going to come for him, uh, is, is understanding that we've got to do it in research. We can't afford to have farmers investing hundreds of thousands, in some cases millions of dollars of equipment, to be the guinea pigs to see what works and what doesn't. So therefore, we've travelled the world. We've been to Europe last year, um, twice to the US this year. We've now signed an agreement with SRES, Seed Requ Research Equipment Solutions, and that planter up there is the most common planter being sold, and, and their sales have gone through the roof into Canada where they're bringing these in, that's singulating wheat, so that's on a seven inch row spacing, singulating wheat, canola, and that, those row units can then be flexed out to various row spacings to be able to spatially manage each individual, ind individual plant. Now when you get down to plant management, you start to say, well, how far do we go? And that's a bit over the top if you understand where each individual plant is. This, this map up here is actually a phosphorus map, so we can take those images to give us a, a profile and understand that 3D type approach, understand what's in the profile and then place our research sites onto those zones, understanding what our limitations are and variability within those sites, predetermine each individual seed's place by location, by GPS, compensate for uh, uh, variability within germination and then put those out there. And the reason why we go down that path is that this type of equipment that we're now developing for um, DAF, so DPI or now DAF in Queensland, these two planters we built in the last, uh, since or we delivered those in Christmas, uh, in the Christmas period, those machines now have the ability to singulate by row on all crops, similar to Brad's machine. This machine was planting uh, sorghum at five inches deep, ch chasing moisture down, taking an opportunity of a, of a, of a planting an opportunity without a rain event. And that's where we're really seeing the ability to get in and, and make things happen with precision ag in the east. But at the same time, that technology, as we develop it over here and over there, and the ability to work with Brad, it's interesting that we had to come to Western Australia to get th a farmer that was innovative enough to want to take us to that next level uh, and very quickly. So, uh, so that's why we ended up here. So in conclusion, where we see our opportunity to work together in collaboration. And if there's ever going to be a, a need for Australian farmers, industry people, from agronomists right through to grain marketing organisations, is that collaboration to, is to innovate is going to be critical to move forward in the, into the future. So one of the things that we've done, we've just patented the concept or registered and trademarked the concept of pot, plot, paddock, plate, or pot, plot, paddock. What that means is that we are, we're now building the equipment, for example, is uh, University of Queensland. Up in the top left there, you see the, uh, 
the phenotyping uh, greenhouse that we've built. So we're building the, um, the facilities now, working with the uh, universities and research scientists to be able to put one plant in one pot, understand that GNO type in an environment, put it through the phenotyping process, and then take that to the field. So then we go into the, um, the small plot research. We need to be able to understand and why I'm saying GPS locate each individual seed, because the information that we've collected in the greenhouse is by GPS location. It's look at the biomass. We've got NDVI, LIDAR, thermo imaging. We're actually monitoring those plants with water use efficiency for every second of the day. So that technology is there now to whether it's canola, wheat or sorghum or corn, it doesn't matter. The technology is there, we're understanding it in the plant, but we're not taking mechanisation to the level to deliver the solutions to the field that we need to. So therefore that's why we're going to the small plot research, which is where we've joined bringing the Monosem seed meter, which is also an alloy cast seed meter with a, a, a stainless steel plate. Not only are we seeing the static in, in the plastic plates, we're also seeing that that if we use a stainless steel plate, we get away from the, uh, the static problems. Uh, and also with the SRES system, we can now take up to 30 solenoids. Uh, and for example, you could have a, a liquid tank of NPK sulfur zinc separated, and we can use then GPS locate and, and sh shoot that, those elements in with the seeds on the fly. And at each changeover, so anyone that's involved in research or farmers that do research plots, when you've got a six metre plot, uh, and you go through to where you've got a, a, a one metre alleyway. So continuously planning this will GPS lo each, locate each seed. We can also then place the elements relevant to that zone to be able to look at how we manage that. And then in 0.8 of a second, it'll change over to the next variety. Suck the one variety out, put the next one in, and then go on from there. So, so the small plot management system to understand commercial research. And then when we get to the field, we've got so much data and so much understanding about that spatial management in a 3D form that we can then go to the field and look at the, how we data, uh, capture the data, analyse it, apply it, and uh, the commercial, commercial commodity application system. So the only step there is to understand our documentation to, under, to, to record the quality of a product that we're delivering to the plate, uh, to the end user. So the pot, plot, paddock, plate is where we're looking to get collaboration by industry players to look at how we can deliver solutions to the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that really intriguing talk. I guess one of the reasons is that traditionally we've had cheap seed in Australia. You know, you said the biotech revolution and, and we've got the open pollinated canola variety. So I guess part of your th collective thinking is the more expensive hybrid seeds which, which make these uh, technologies more, more uh, cost effective. Is that right? Um, when, I, when I was doing the modelling on it, which is a really easier, which is really easy to do on a spreadsheet because it's very linear, when we were looking at our, our seed reduction rates, my payback period for the machine alone was about six years. When we brought the assumption in, just using the data that the Canadians have had from their research and um, putting the yield increase. Um, our payback came to back to 2.3 years and our return on investment for that particular machine was 27%. Last year we, we, uh, we didn't actually achieve much on the, on the top end of it because it was a kind year for canola. This year with that long dry June uh, stretching into July, uh, our singulated canola has stood out a lot more in front of our conventionally seeded canola. Um, so yeah. It's going, to take, it's going to take a good five years time span to be able to break down all the data unless we, unless we can have more people engaging in it and the more, the more heads we can get around the table, the better it'll be. Can I just briefly add to that too? Brad's had a lot to do with, um, and where we've had also communication with the likes of Horsch and other companies around the world trying to understand where it really works with uh, mechanisation. <laughs> And it's interesting that in Germany, if you look at their seeding rates, they're still up in the very high. They're talking 200, uh, seed, 200 seeds per square metre. 100 is a lighter rate. They really very rarely become, come below that. So they're not seeing great responses to canola, but their genetic improvement moving towards the GMOs being non-GMO, they're not seeing that. But interestingly, where they are seeing gains 
is wheat. So by singulating wheat, bringing their population so they're getting high yield, yielding wheats, so that's each individual plant's response to yield. And that's similar to what we've seen in research in wheat in Australia around feed wheat types. When we're not getting the protein um, gains by growing protein, then the, our lower grade wheats now are lower protein wheats, so typically where the yields are. So I think that that's what they're seeing, but also their ability to manage disease and uh, herbicide insecticides as well by spatially managing is where they're getting the gain. So it was really interesting here in the European side. Last year we had uh, a much better result than this year because this year where we used it, touch wood, we were really lucky that uh, at the end of April we had a big storm and uh, between 40 and 75 mil which set us up for the rest of the year. But it, the unfortunate thing behind that was uh, we had a lot of country seal over and it took its time to, to come through. Um, if you notice the, the slide um, during the video and we were like, you know, bench testing it and we were sort of 98% success rate. Uh, we've been lucky to get mid 80s. And like when we started to look at the reason why, static electricity was one of them. And, and one of the biggest issues that we have in Australia is seed size. So we had uh, Michael Horsch um, at home not so long ago and we had a few guys come over and we sat down and had a few beers with him and a bit of a yak. and. And he was, he was basically saying that your seed in Australia is shit. Sorry to the seed breeders out there, but it is. And until we can fix that, our success rates aren't going to be so great.